Patients with neurological diseases or traumatic damage to their nervous system often lose the ability to control their muscles, resulting in paralysis that may restrict their ability to speak, use their hands, or their legs. An example of this is physicist and professor Stephen Hawking, who was diagnosed with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS, in 1963. Now, this is a slowly progressing disease that affected the nerve cells that control his muscles, ultimately leaving him paralyzed. Despite this, he had a productive scientific career, publishing over 200 scientific articles, papers, children's books, uh, and he was able to give lectures. He was able to do this using an assistive technology that used infrared switch that detects cheek movements in order to select letters from a keyboard on a computer monitor. Once he used that to create sentences, he would send that then to his voice synthesizer. Another example of assistive technology is what we see with patients with quadriplegia, uh, a paralysis that affects their arms and their legs, uh, and these patients are unable to move on their own, but they're able to control their wheelchairs by blowing into a straw. Uh, more recently, uh, at Georgia Tech, uh, a new interface was developed that allows greater control of the wheelchair using a patient's tongue. As science and technology advances, the technologies associated with these assistive technologies continue to improve. Right now, scientists are working on advanced technologies that will allow patients to overcome the loss of their nervous system control. One example of this is Elon Musk's Neuralink brain chip. However, in order to get access to this advanced system, you must have a piece of your skull removed and this brain chip inserted into your brain. So this gives rise to our ethical dilemma in science for this week. Should you implant Elon Musk's Neuralink into your brain? So what is it? What are these brain-computer interfaces and how do they work? And should we be considering them? The way that the nervous system works is that we make conscious decisions, voluntary decisions, up here within our brain. Uh, and then nerve cells are going to send that information along long cellular processes in much the same way as uh, wires uh, connecting uh, a circuit. Uh, but in this case, we've got cellular projections that will extend down from the brain uh, into the spinal cord, and then from another neuron, uh, they're gonna extend their process out, uh, out of the spinal cord, out of the vertebral column, and make connections with the muscles, allowing for voluntary movement. For an individual that has some type of spinal cord injury, as illustrated in this slide here, we've disrupted that connection. Uh, we basically screwed up with the wiring, uh, and we've interfered with the ability of these decisions up here in the brain to be sent down to control the muscles. So what we're seeing with these brain-computer interfaces is this idea that we can record the information up here uh, within the level of the brain, uh, bypass the damaged region of the nervous system, and then using some type of stimulating device, uh, we can control the muscles by bypassing the spinal cord and the normal neuronal connections by using these interfaces to control the muscles of our body. Now, the technology for these brain-computer interfaces continues to improve, uh, but the first neural implants or can't, have been around since the 1960s. Uh, cochlear implants are the first example of a neural implant used to restore function to uh, some type of impaired sensation or impaired region to the nervous system. Uh, in this case, uh, what we've got is going to be uh, some type of recording device uh, like a hearing aid right here uh, that is going to convert that sound into an electrical signal and that electrical signal is going to be transmitted into the hearing nerve, what would be the acoustic nerve, and so we're able to bypass the damaged region of the hearing structure, the damaged region uh, within the inner portion of the ear. Uh, and so this is technology that's been around for over 60 years now. Now, the first neural implants were relatively crude, and they basically converted some type of stimulus into an electrical signal. More recently, uh, we've been working with brain-computer interfaces in which we were able to use some type of system that records brain activity and translates that into a signal for the computer. Now, the first brain-computer interface is the Utah Array that was approved for use by the federal 
Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, in 1992. So we can see uh, an example of the Utah array here, uh, really tiny, so you see it sitting here on top of a fingernail. Uh, and this array is able to send signals from the brain of paraplegic patients into a computer system, and that computer system would then be used to control robot arms. Now, this system is limited by the 1990s technology, uh, including things like the fact that this uh, Utah array uses rigid electrodes, basically kind of firm wires that are inserted into the brain, uh, and these wires can cause inflammation and ultimately scarring of the brain, which can further complicate and impair the use of this uh, for the recovery of function. As this technology has continued to improve, we are moving from this area of science fiction into science possibility and soon to be science fact. Uh, now, an example of this is the Neuralink company founded in 2016 by Elon Musk. Uh, the Neuralink device uh, is actually about the size of a quarter. Uh, and so you can see it here held uh, within the fingers of a hand. Uh, coming down from the device is uh, about 1,024 electrodes that are located on 64 threads that are thinner than a human hair. Uh, and so these threads would then be inserted into the brain uh, and then record the activity of the nerve cells of the brain. Now this device uses Bluetooth technology in which it can send a signal uh, to a device, a recording device outside of the body. And so this is a dramatic improvement over previous systems in which they had to have a wired connection. And so the implant would be uh, inserted into the brain, uh, but the individuals would have a wire coming out of their skull that had to be plugged into a device. Now, the goal of these brain-computer interfaces, like Neuralink, is to restore function to paraplegic patients, uh, but it also may benefit patients with Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, uh, epilepsy, and other neurological conditions. Now, at this point, uh, there's been extensive testing done on animal models such as pigs, rats, and monkeys. Now, in one very, very dramatic demonstration of this, uh, they were able to show that a monkey is capable of playing the video game Pong using only the Neuralink interface. Uh, and so what happens uh, is illustrated on the slide up here. Uh, they were training a monkey to play the game with a joystick, and they're holding the, the joystick in his hand right over here. Uh, and when he did the, the proper move, when he was able to hit the, the ball with the paddle uh, within the Pong game, uh, the monkey would receive a banana smoothie uh, for these correct moves through this straw. Now, ultimately, while the monkey was learning how to play the game, he had the neural link inserted into his brain, and the neural link was recording the brain activity and corresponding that to the activities of the joystick moving back and forth to play the game. Once the monkey had learned how to play the game, uh, the joystick was disconnected, and the the, uh, the paddle in the game, in the game Pong, was controlled by the Neuralink device. Uh, and it was very, very dramatic that where they were able to do this. Now, at this point, uh, in fall 2023, uh, the FDA has approved for the Neuralink uh, to be used in the first human clinical trial. Um, but it's important to recognize that Neuralink is considered a class three medical device, which has a high risk to the patient, similar to that of the implanted pacemakers. Now, Neuralink isn't the only company working to develop these uh, brain-computer interfaces. Other companies are working on similar systems. Now, an example of this uh, is Synchron. Uh, Synchron has this kind of collapsible wire mesh right here uh, that they're able to implant uh, any much less invasive surgery uh, than the traditional uh, implants like the Neuralink or the Utah Array. Uh, what they're able to do is they don't need to remove a piece of the skull. They're actually able to thread this through a blood vessel up through the neck into the brain using a catheter. Uh, and so it's a much less uh, invasive surgery, uh, much better prognosis, less risk of infection, less risk of complication. Now, Synchron has implanted these devices into four patients with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS, much like uh, Stephen Hawking's uh, had. Uh, so these were patients in Australia, uh, and with the Synchron device implanted into their brains, they were able to send messages with the WhatsApp app, WhatsApp app. 
uh, texting app, uh, as well as to do online uh, shopping. Now, Synchron has received FDA approval for human trials uh, as of mid-2021. Now, there are a number of concerns about taking some type of external device and implanting it into the body, let alone implanting it into the brain. Uh, and so there are concerns about the safety of the device, and at least with Neuralink, there are published accounts uh, raising concerns about what's happened with some of the animals that was tested on. Uh, but we're going to focus in on another concern, uh, and that's what happens if that implant was to degrade or break down uh, and the company is no longer supporting that technology. Uh, and this isn't a, a fictional worry. This is a, a real concern. Uh, an example of this is the, the second site uh, interface, which basically formed like bionic eyes. Uh, uh, what happened is that uh, these would have a camera uh, which was to be attached to a, a pair of glasses. Uh, the camera would be able to record what the object or the person is looking at, the objects that the person is looking at, and then that is converted into an electrical signal that would then stimulate uh, the back of the eye, the, the, the sensory cells, the, the cells of the retina that are normally converting light signals into a kind of vision. Uh, in this case, that conversion of the light signals into an electrical signal uh, would go into this array on the retina and then convert the uh, retina would convert that into a nervous system signal. Uh, the company Second Sight uh, stopped supporting their device. Uh, they actually went out of business. Uh, their company was taken over and purchased. Um, and their intellectual property uh, was obtained by that new company. Uh, and it's yet to be determined whether or not that new company is going to continue to support this older technology. But for a patient that received these implants, um, if, it, if it stops working, they're out of luck. Uh, and they potentially have to go through another invasive surgery to have the device removed. And the removal of that device could end up giving them further complications. So this leads us to our ethical dilemma in science for this week. Should you implant Elon Musk's Neuralink into your brain? Uh, and we focus on two questions related to that. Should access to these brain-computer interfaces be limited to patients attempting to restore function, or should it be available to people for non-medical purposes? Uh, there are talks that uh, individuals would be able to use these devices to uh, control their TV remote or to uh, do remote shopping or, or texting. Uh, and so should this be used solely for restoration of function or for other purposes? Secondly, what obligation do medical device companies have to support and maintain their implant technology, uh, especially for the patients that have had these devices for an extended period of time? Thank you for listening to this week's Ethical Dilemma in Science. As always, please see the description below for additional information and references. Thank you and have a great week.